Tamastu, ma vid vishavahai. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om, may the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good evening and namaste everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening class, <coughs> which is just starting Bhagavad Gita. Uh, we last time we met, which was some time ago now, we read the uh, cosmology of the Gita, the appendix, and the translator's preface, both of which are very important uh, parts of this book and uh, should be read by anyone who uh, starts to read the Gita before they uh, tackle the Gita itself, because they say so much about what the intentions of the translator are and uh, the frame of reference from which Sri Krishna is speaking. This evening, we'll read the introduction, which was written by Aldous Huxley. Uh, Aldous Huxley was Swami Prabhavananda's disciple. And this introduction, of course, was written with the, uh, at, the, at the Swami's request. And uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, of course, coordinated with the Swami about what he was saying. But nevertheless, this is Aldous Huxley's opinion and his in understanding of the Gita, which was a profound one, as we can imagine. So with that, are there any comments or questions that anyone would like to raise before we begin the reading? All right, dears. Uh, Swayam is our reader. Thank you so very much, dear. Uh, <clears throat> let's just go ahead with Aldous Huxley's introduction to Bhagavad Gita. Okay. <clears throat> introduction, and that's page five. More than 25 centuries have passed since that which has been called the perennial philosophy was first committed to writing. And in the course of those centuries, it has found expression now partial, now complete, now in this form, now in that, again and again. In Vedanta and Hebrew prophecy, in the Tao Te Ching and the Platonic dialogues in the Gospel according to St. John and Mahayana theology, in Plotinus and the Areopagite, among the Persian Sufis and the Christian mystics of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the perennial philosophy has spoken almost all the languages of Asia and Europe and has made use of the terminology and traditions 
of every one of the higher religions. But under all this confusion of tongues and myths, of local histories and particularist doctrines, there remains a highest common factor, which is the perennial philosophy in what may be called its chemically pure state. This final purity can never, of course, be expressed by any verbal statement of the philosophy, however undogmatic that <clears throat> statement may be, however deliberately syncretistic. The very fact that it is set down at a certain time by a certain writer using this or that language automatically imposes a certain sociological and personal bias on the doctrine so formulated. It is only in the act of contemplation when words and even personality are transcended that the pure state of the perennial philosophy can actually be known. No, there, there is the axis of of his introduction. So would you read that again about uh, uh, the turning inward, at the, at the act of contemplation or concentration meditation? Would you read that again, please? Okay. Um, I'll actually read a sentence before that as well. Right. The very fact that it is set down, set down at a certain time by a certain writer using this or that language automatically imposes a certain sociological and personal bias on the doctrine so formulated. It is only in the act of contemplation when words or even personality are transcended that the pure state of the perennial philosophy can actually be known. This And this is what is said. He mentions all of these mystics from all of these languages, all of these eras, all of these traditions. And this is what they all say. It's It cannot be understood. It cannot be grasped by the mind turned outward. It's only when the in attention is turned inward that we grasp the meaning and the substance of the eternal philosophy or perennial philosophy, which is his translation of the term Sanatana Dharma, which of course is the proper name for the spiritual the traditions of India. So are there any comments or questions from anyone by at this point? The, I guess the very fact that there are so many translations over the years and continue to be newer and newer translations uh, attests to that, that it cannot be fully comprehended just by somebody else's um, interpretation, no matter yes. who it is. And these, these new translations keep coming up to try to portray the inner understanding of such people as Eknat Eshwaran and uh, others who have uh, translated the Gita after uh, Swami Prabhavananda did. And of course, Swami Prabhavananda's uh, understanding and grasp of the meaning of the Gita was rooted in his uh, transcendent state of awareness. Uh, he was, of course, understood to be an illumined soul, a, a, a something granted to him, that illumination was granted to him by his own statement by Swami Brahmananda Raja Maharaj, 
the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who Raja Maharaj was Swami Prabhupada's guru or master, as he called it. So, but it, that does not mean it cannot be uh, grasped by each of us. Each of us has complete access to the 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 spiritual treasure chest of the incarnations and they will give us if we apply ourselves and are sincere they will they will give us the ability to understand uh, as Sri Ramakrishna says it is in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna practice just a little and someone will come forward to help you and by that he means Kali herself come forward to give you instruction and understanding. So thank you, Swayam. Anything else from anyone? Um, Brother Shankar, I'm curious that you mentioned uh, Eknath Ishwaran, because um, that was the translation that was suggested when my son was doing his uh, master's. He had taken an elective course, and that translation of the Gita was his part of his coursework. It's understood to be an excellent translation based on uh, Eswaran's illumination himself. I mean, he was, he, he was a remarkable teacher. And so uh, I don't know a great deal about him myself, only his reputation. But it's understood that his translation of the Gita was based on knowledge with a capital K, a, 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 a relationship and correspondence with uh, <clears throat> Sri Krishna's uh, being. This is what uh, is, it comes, comes to these uh, illumined souls. I so, that. Yeah. so this is uh, this is uh, yes it's it's uh, Ishwaran's translation is known to be a, uh, a very uh, elevated one anything else from anyone all right dears let's go ahead just a side note here <clears throat> namaste brother shankara namaste everybody this is Shari. yes hello Shaila. Uh, Eknath Ishwaranji uh, met uh, Swami Ramdas, Papa Ramdas. Um, it comes in as one of the. So he wrote actually an uh, introduction to Papa Ramdas as uh, in quest of God and uh, part one, part two, part three. And Papa Ramdas was exceptionally highly elevated soul. I mean, I would call him a Paramahamsa. And so, um, you know, they got at, I mean, he obviously got attracted towards Papa Ramdas and. Uh, sat at his feet uh, in Kasargod in Kerala. Um, so uh, obviously that must have been a part of his, uh, I don't know, I mean, I have not read much about him, but that's just a side note I wanted to add. So I'm sure he was enriched by Papa Ramdas's company as Darshan, you know. Well, yes, <laughs> these great ones, they automatically pass along to us whatever we are capable of accepting. I mean, that is the reason they exist. So uh, it's that is an interesting side note that he he uh, had this uh, relationship, and no doubt that was very auspicious for him. And, and who knows how that would translate into realization and and knowledge. But uh, these great ones, each and every one, it's Swami Prabhupada used to say in their presence, uh, the, the knowledge of God is as tangible as, as if they were holding a fruit in the palm of their hand. And so we can take and eat, or uh, we can uh, not accept that invitation. But nevertheless, it's there, always. And I, I think that especially the 70s and the 80s, uh, or the 60s, I would say, was a, was a time when there were a lot of uh, elevated souls, I would say. I mean, I'm sure there are today, too. 
Uh, oh, yes, yes. But yes, uh, there, was, there was more genuineness, I would say, uh, you could, you could well, find. I don't, I don't know how to quantify that, Shailesh, but uh, how, how shall I disagree with you? Of course, if that's your perception, then it must be. Yeah, enough. I mean, my, uh, you know, I was reading about it. Sorry for this, uh, for the discussion, but someone was saying that uh, usually the power of any spiritual figure will uh, usually come out and express. And you can see that in, in 50 years, you know, uh, approximate. And I thought about it and usually that's, uh, it may be less, more or less, but that, that spiritual power just starts manifesting. And, uh, and so yes. if you look at, um, if you look at Papa Ramdas or all those people in the 60s and 70s, we think, uh, we, we we would I would uh, would have loved to meet or you know see them once you know Ramana Maharshi or Papa Ramdas or Unjaji or or some yes, other things. Uh, all that's true. And yes. several of them, uh, several of the elevated souls from the Ramakrishna order, Swami Vireshwaranandaji and uh, Swami Shankaranandaji and uh, you you Swami Madhavanandaji, you know you read about them, and of course Swami Prabhanandaji, you were lucky. Uh, so yes, uh, all of that, all of that is uh, no doubt and a full actuality. Thank you, Shailesh. All right, thank you. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please read on, dear. We can't hear you. You must be yeah, muted. I was muted. Um... The records left by those who have known it in this way make it abundantly clear that all of them, whether Hindu, Buddhist, Hebrew, Taoist, Christian or Muslim, were attempting to describe the same essentially indescribable fact. The original scriptures of most religions are poetical and unsystematic. Theology, which generally takes the form of a reasoned comment commentary on the parables and aphorisms of the scriptures, tends to make its appearance at a later stage of religious history. The Bhagavad Gita occupies an intermediate position between scripture and theology for it combines the poetical qualities of the first with the clear-cut methodical, methodicalness of the second. The book may be described, writes Ananda K. Kumaraswamy in his admirable Hinduism and Buddhism, as a compendium of the whole Vedic doctrine to be found in the earlier Vedas, Brahmanas, and Upanishads, and being therefore the basis of all the later developments, it can be regarded as the focus of all Indian religion. But this focus of Indian religion is also one of the clearest and most comprehensive summaries of the perennial philosophy ever to have been made. Hence, its enduring value, not only for Indians, but for all mankind. At the core of the perennial philosophy, we find four fundamental doctrines. First, the phenomenal world of matter and of individualized consciousness, the world of things and animals and men and even gods, is the manifestation of a divine ground within which all partial realities have their being and apart from which they would be non-existent. Second, human beings are capable not merely knowing about the divine ground by inference, they can also realize its existence by a direct intuition, superior to discursive reasoning. This immediate knowledge 
unites the knower with that which is known. Third, man possesses a double nature, a phenomenal ego and an eternal capital self, which is the inner man, the spirit, the spark of divinity within the soul. It is possible for a man, if he so desires, to identify himself with the spirit and therefore with the divine ground, which is of the same or like nature with the spirit, or like nature with the spirit. Fourth, man's life on earth has only one end and purpose to identify himself with his eternal self and so to come to unitive knowledge of the divine ground. In Hinduism, the first of these four doctrines is stated in the most categorical terms. The divine ground is Brahman, whose creative, sustaining and transforming aspects are manifested in the Hindu Trinity. A hierarchy of manifestations connects inanimate matter with man, gods, high gods, and the undifferentiated Godhead beyond. In Mahayana Buddhism, the divine ground is called mind or the pure light of the void. The place of high gods is taken by Dhyani Buddhas. Similar conceptions are perfectly compatible with Christianity and have in fact been entertained explicitly or implicitly by many Catholic and Protestant mystics when formulating a philosophy to fit facts observed by super-rational intuition. Thus, for Eckhart and Ruse Breck, there is an abyss of Godhead underlying the Trinity, just as Brahman underlies Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. <coughs> Suso has even left a diagrammatic picture of the relations subsisting between Godhead, Triune, God, and creatures. In this very curious and interesting drawing, a chain of manifestation <coughs> connects the mysterious symbol of the divine ground with the three persons of the Trinity. And the Trinity is in turn connected in a descending scale with angels and human beings. These last, as the drawing vividly shows, may make one of two choices. They can either lead the life of the outer man, life of the separative selfhood, in which case they are lost. For in the words of theologica, Theologia Germanica, nothing burns in hell but the small self. Or else they can identify themselves with the inner man, in which case it becomes possible for them, as Suso shows, to ascend again through intuitive knowledge to the Trinity and even beyond the Trinity to the ultimate unity of the divine ground. I and my Father are one. Be ye perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. This is Christ's teaching that is exactly this. You go beyond to the thing itself. I am the vine, you are the branches. The vine is rooted in that divine ground. Unspeakable, unknowable by the mind, knowable by the inner self, 
that uh, Huxley has been speaking of. It is accessible to each and every one of us. And each one of the incarnations, the avatars as they come, say, turn your head in that direction. Turn your attention toward me. And I will give you all that there is to have. Nothing hidden will not be revealed. And so this is, this is our quest, and this is the reason to study the Gita, because as Huxley pointed out some uh, sentences back, some paragraphs back, the Gita is both uh, the highest form of spiritual philosophy, but it is also a workbook. Sri Krishna tells us how to do this how to turn inward, why to turn inward, and what the, what the fruits of uh, turning away from the world of matter and manifestation to the world of the inner reality, the divine ground. Any comments or questions from anyone? All right, here's Peter. I'm going to ask you, Swayam, so to go back and read those four fundamental principles of the those fundamental uh, foundation, the foundational four uh, uh, statements of the perennial philosophy. And read read that from the beginning again, if you would, please. Sure. At the core of the perennial philosophy, we find four fundamental doctrines. First, the phenomenal world of matter and of individualized consciousness, the world of things and animals and men and even gods is the manifestation of a divine ground within which all partial realities have their being and apart from which they would be non-existent second human beings are capable not merely of knowing about the divine ground by inference they can also realize its existence by a direct intuition superior to discursive reasoning this immediate knowledge unites the knower with that which is known. Third, man possesses a double nature, a phenomenal ego and an eternal self, which is the inner man, the spirit, the spark of divinity within the soul. It is possible for a man if he so desires to identify himself with the spirit and therefore with the divine ground, which is of the same or like, which is of the same or like nature with the spirit. Man is made in the image of God, the reflection, the reflection of God. That's what's being said here. We are that reflection of the divine. And when we, the mirror of the heart is wiped clean, as uh, Chaitanya Deva puts it, uh, when the mirror of the heart is wiped clean, we see that reflection purely and perfectly. So read that sentence again, if you would, please, before you read on, dear. Sure. It is possible for a man, if he so desires, to identify himself with the spirit and therefore with the divine ground which is of the same or like nature with the spirit fourth man's life on earth has only one end and purpose to identify himself with the eternal self and so to come to unitive knowledge of the divine ground 
Okay. Anything, anything else from anyone? Okay, please read on, dear. Within the Muslim tradition, such a rationalization of the immediate mystical experience would have been dangerously unorthodox. Nevertheless, one has the impression while reading certain Sufi texts that their authors in, did in fact conceive of Al-Haq, the real, as being the divine ground or unity of Allah, underlying the active and personal aspects of the Godhead. The second doctrine of the perennial philosophy that it is possible to know the divine ground by a direct intuition higher than discursive reasoning is to be found in all the great religions of the world. A philosopher who is content merely to know about the ultimate reality, theoretically and by hearsay, is compared by Buddha to a herdsman of other men's cows. <laughs> Muhammad uses an even homelier barnyard metaphor. For him, the philosopher who has not realized his metaphysics is just an ass bearing a load of books. Christian, Hindu, Taoist teachers wrote no less emphatically about the absurd pretensions of mere learning and analytical reasoning. In the words of the Anglican prayer book, Our Eternal Life, Now and Hereafter, stands in the knowledge of God. And this knowledge... Read that sentence again, please, dear. I think you... Yeah, I didn't sister. emphasize it correctly, I think. In the words of the Anglican prayer book, our... In the words of the Anglican prayer book, Our Eternal Life, Now and Hereafter, stands in the knowledge of God. Right. And this knowledge is not discursive, but of the heart. A super of the heart. Notice, it is not, not discursive knowledge. It is not of the left mind. It is not of the language mind. It is of the silent knowledge which we access through contemplation, concentration, and meditation, where we come to know the knowledge of the heart, the deep silence of, of the heart. So this is, this is what's being pointed to here. And once again, what Sri Krishna t teaches throughout the Gita in one way or another, is exactly that. Turn inward, no matter what else you are doing, whatever, whatever of the other yogas that he teaches you're practicing, turn inward, turn inward through meditation to understand what it is that you are being and doing. Any comments or concerns or questions from anyone? Um, Brother Shankara, can you expand on on the uh, phrase in quotes, stands in the knowledge of God, our eternal life now and hereafter stands in the knowledge of God? When we take the dust of the feet of a sadhu, we're not worshipping the sadhu. We're worshiping the knowledge that that sadhu stands on. Nun or monk, this is what's being recognized and, 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 uh, and bowed down to. It is only in this knowledge that is intuitive knowledge, not inferential or discursive knowledge, 
it is only in this intuitive knowledge that we have anything really to stand on. Otherwise, in, in the metaphor that's so often used in the Christian religion, you're building a house on sand. The sand will move and the house will fall. So when you build your uh, house on the solid ground of true understanding, then you then that house will stand. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Most people, when they take the dust of a sadhu's feet, they don't really understand what that little ceremony is about. <clears throat> of course, it shows respect for the for the human being <clears throat> standing above. <clears throat> But that human being, if you ask them, they will say, I am nothing. The knowledge is everything. I am nothing because the body will come and go. This body will come and go, no matter how we want to hang on to it. This body will come and go. And, but the knowledge that... Uh, has been gained through the, uh, the use of this vehicle, uh, turning within, that knowledge will not go. It will be carried forward into whatever form uh, that being takes after the outer body drops away. Anything else from anyone? All right, tears, please read on. Um, <clears throat> the third doctrine of the perennial philosophy, that which affirms the double nature of man, is fundamental in all the higher religions. The unitive knowledge of the divine ground has, as its necessary condition, self-abnegation and charity. Only by means of self-abnegation and charity can we clear away the evil, folly, and ignorance which constitute the thing we call our personality and prevent us from becoming aware of the spark of divinity illuminating the inner man. Hold on. The self-abnegation, just so we'll translate out of uh, Aldous Huxley's English, it means the same thing as renunciation or self-surrender. We often hear those terms more than self-abnegation. Self-abnegation means self-surrender, means release of the self. And this is what renunciation is. Renunciation is not pushing away the world. Uh, and our, our experience of the world, it is releasing it. And so this is what's meant by self-abnegation. So would you read that again, please, just so if there was any misunderstanding or, or not, no, not knowledge of that word? The unitive knowledge of the divine ground has, as its necessary condition, self-abnegation and charity. Only by means of self-abnegation and charity can we clear away the evil, folly, and ignorance which constitute the thing we call our personality and prevent us from becoming aware of the spark of divinity illuminating the inner man. But the spark within is akin to the divine ground. By identifying ourselves with the first, we can come to the unitive knowledge of the second. These empirical facts of the spiritual life have been variously rationalized in terms of the theologies of the various religions. The Hindus categorically affirm that thou art that that the indwelling Atman is the same as Brahman, 
for orthodox christianity there is not an identity between the spark and the god union of the human spirit with god takes place union so complete that the word deification is applied to it but it is not the union of identical substances according to christian theology the saint is deified not because atman is brahman but because god has assimilated the purified human spirit into the divine substance by an act of grace islamic theology seems to make a similar distinction the sufi mansur was executed for giving to the words union and deification the literal meaning which they bear in the hindu tradition for our present purposes however the significant fact is that these words are actually used by christians and muslims to describe the empirical facts of metaphysical realization by means of direct super rational intuition direct super rational intuition this is what we this is what we find when we turn inward and practice long enough to sink below the level of the thinking mind and the uh, sense, uh, the, the, the attractions of sense awareness uh, through the direct senses and through our memory of direct senses uh, of, the, of those sensory experiences. We sink below the thinking mind. We sink below the involvement with our sensory organs, both in the immediate sense and in the sense of remembering uh, those sensory experiences. And we sink into something that is entirely new to us. If we practice, this is what happens. We come into this direct intuitional knowledge of something of the, it's, it, it, Huxley spoke of it as something of the heart, it is knowledge of the Atman. We understand that that is something in us un gives us that direct understanding that that is who we are. That, that, this, that, that, that when it says thou art that, that thou art, this is the truth of our being. Now, in the beginning, uh, when when you first make this encounter, it comes and it goes. But it once you've had it, that experience, that direct intuitional experience, it can never disappear from your awareness. So it attracts you back again and again until finally you have what is called savikalpa or uh, Savikalpa Samadhi or, or Samadhi with seeds, that is to say, that ev everything that uh, is phenomenal uh, is still present but dormant. But that Savikalpa Samadhi, then there's no longer any idea of I, the small I being primary. Thou becomes primary. Thou. The thou as in thou, that thou art. And so you, you, you feel yourself to be a part of the divine being. Any comments or questions about any of that? All right, dear. Please go ahead. Direct super rational intuition. It's available to each one of us. It's just a matter of practice. In regard to man's final end, 
all the higher religions are in complete agreement. The purpose of human life is the discovery of truth with a capital T, the unitive knowledge of the Godhead. The degree to which this unitive knowledge is achieved here on earth determines the degree to which it will be enjoyed in the posthumous state. The the contemplation of the contemplation of truth is the end action the means in india in china in ancient greece in christian europe this was regarded as the most obvious and axiomatic piece of orthodoxy the invention of the steam engine produced a revolution not merely in industrial techniques, but also and much more significantly in philosophy. Because machines could be made progressively more and more efficient, the Western man came to believe that men and societies would automatically register a corresponding moral and spiritual improvement. Attention and allegiance came to be paid not to eternity but to the utopian future external circumstances came to be regarded as more important than states of mind about states of mind about external circumstances with um, sorry let me start that again external circumstances came to be regarded as more important than states of mind about external circumstances and the end of human life was held to be action with comp contemplation as a means to that end these false and historically aberrant and heretical doctrines are now systematically taught in our schools and repeated day in and day out by those anonymous writers of advertising copy who more than any other teachers provide European and American adults with their current philosophy of life. Isn't that an interesting observation? Hmm. <laughs> that it is advertising copywriters that are telling us how to think. How bizarre. And it's, it's a very good reason to stay away from their, and, and by the way, that way of being and thinking com is completely inherent in the things that the, the, these, these, the shows that these uh, advertising copywriters are writing the advertising for that same frame of reference is there. So if you watch television shows, you're getting educated in this aberrant, horribly aberrant philosophy. And it is a philosophy. Perfectionism. And it is, it's just, it's perfectly nonsense. Anything else from anyone before we before we go on? Brother Shankara, can you explain a little bit what is copyright or who copywriting? Are... Copywriting. I mean, the the uh, when somebody produces a commercial or a a, a, a print ad for uh, the uh, for a magazine, that that person is called a copywriter. They're the ones who produce, who write down what the uh, announcer is going to say if it's a, if it's a voiceover ad on television or radio, or now on uh, the internet, or if it's if it's a written ad, they're the ones who write that copy. The the copy is the text that is either read or printed. Mm -hmm. When I took advertising class, for example, uh, there was a, 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 
a soap that uh, we were directed to create an ad for. It's, it's a clear soap. And so the award-winning headline uh, of, of that uh, advertising class was, this soap won't help start wrinkles. Mm. This soap won't help start wrinkles, which is, of course, the dread thing for uh, many uh, people in getting a wrinkled face. So this hope, the, 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 what is true, but not said in the headline is no soap, no good soap helps start wrinkles. So, you know, the, that, that was the award-winning headline in that advertising class. This soap won't help start wrinkles because it, it grabs your attention. And you think, oh, well, I'll use this soap because it won't help start wrinkles. Masking the fact that that's true of all good soaps. So what uh, is known as sort of sound bites too? Like you know, sound bites are, are definitely just bits of advertising copy that uh, people uh, uh, remember and uh, pass along. Sometimes they become memes on the internet. Uh, recently, I read something, and of course, I don't know if it was uh, intentional or, but the um, heading was slow cognitive uh, decline by use of flavonoids. So the way I interpreted it was that if you consume flavonoids, you're going to slowly have cognitive decline. But the actual meaning was the opposite, that you can slow down cognitive decline by consuming certain flavonoids. Well, that was a very poor piece of copywriting is what that was. Mm. If it misled you in that way, mm. then, it, then it was clearly very poorly written copy. Uh, it just, uh, but somehow that got past the editor and, mm. and uh, you know, it, it, because, you know, they share a frame of reference. So <laughs> it's, that's that's part of the the world of of copywriting. You know, it's 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 just so intriguing that when the Super Bowl is uh, played, the great football game each year, you know, there's a, this big hoopla, really big hoopla about the Super Bowl, and one of the things that is uh, is there's a kind of competition among the uh, which is the best advertising. You know the best ads and you know the newspapers and the tv commentators remark on which was the which were the best ads and you know it's like a competition and the advertising industry responds to it they pour tremendous effort and energy and money into creating the best commercials to for the for the and it's all nonsense it's all poppycock you know Pepsi-Cola is not good for you, no matter how, uh, you know, uh, the, the advertising says, Pepsi-Cola or Budweiser beer, you know, these things are, are, you know, it isn't that they're terribly harmful, but they're not good for you. But if you listen to those ads, well, my goodness, I must consume this. But, you know, the world is full of nonsense. <laughs> Full of nonsense. So, how are we doing for time? Um, we have about six minutes left. Okay. Uh, why don't you go back and read that again, so that we get clearly in mind what what uh, what uh, Huxley was getting at okay. about how this. Uh, starting with how this philosophy got started with the invention of the steam engine. Sure. So basically, I'll go back to the beginning of the, the paragraph from the previous page. Right. <clears throat> in regard to man's final end, all the higher religions are in complete agreement. The purpose of human life is the discovery of truth, capital T, 
the unitive knowledge of the Godhead. The degree to which this unitive knowledge is achieved here on earth determines the degree to which it will be enjoyed in the posthumous state. Contemplation of truth is the end, action the means. In India, in China, in ancient Greece, in Christian Europe, this was regarded as the most obvious and axiomatic piece of orthodoxy. The invention of the steam engine produced a revolution, not merely in the industrial techniques, but also and much more significantly in philosophy. Because machines could be made progressively more and more efficient, Western man came to believe that men and societies would automatically register a corresponding moral and spiritual improvement. Attention and allegiance came to be paid not to eternity, but to the utopian future. External circumstances came to be regarded as more important than states of mind about external circumstances. And the end of human life was held to be action with contemplation as a means to that end. These false and historically aberrant and heretical doctrines are now systematically taught in our schools and repeated day in and day out by those anonymous writers of advertising copy who, more than any other teachers, provide European and American adults with their current philosophy of life. And so effective has been the propaganda that even professing Christians accept the hearsay unquestioningly and are quite unconscious of its complete incompatibility with their own or anybody else's religion. Okay, let's leave it there for tonight. Any final comments or questions from anyone? Um, just um, if I can get your thoughts on uh, yes. external circumstances came to be regarded as more important than the states of mind about external circumstances. So is that like, um, we need to have this temperature in the room became more important than kind of observing the, the temperature and the well, state of mind uh, uh, as an example? We, what it says is that we can perfect our external circumstances to where we experience a paradise on earth. This is very, very beautifully demolished this whole idea by Swami Vivekananda in his talk, The Real and the Apparent Man. This idea that we can create through this perfectionism. If machines can be made better and better, well, then human beings can be made better and better too, externally, through their, through their actions. No, it is not through our external actions. It is through our internal or in, internal, eternal quest that, that we perfect ourselves. And perfect ourselves means perfect ourselves, not externally that, that becomes true but these external circumstances. This is why, you know, you must have a better washing machine. You must have a better HVAC system, as you were mentioning temperature in the room. You know, uh, rather than putting on more clothing, we uh, turn up the HVAC, we turn up the heater. Or, or if it's uh, too warm outside, we turn on the air conditioner. Uh, rather than uh, uh, dressing more skimpily. So the, it, it is this idea that we can perfect our external environment to the point where mm. 
is 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 doctor a, a character named Doctor Pangloss in in a, a, a satirical piece says he said this every day in every way things are getting better and better which of course is perfect nonsense you know for the, the externals of, of human life continue to be just as degraded as they always have they're just degraded in a different way now so if we focus on the external the, the world of the senses and of the mind we will achieve the results of that which will what they will perish with the body no matter how successful wealthy famous no matter what are the grandeur of our external circumstances we may have a 26 room mansion perfectly appointed in every way and when the body comes to an end nothing no thing when the body comes to an end, no thing. So our external circumstances cannot be perfected to become a paradise for us because no matter how wonderful it might be, we're going to leave it. The wealthy have every appurtenance. They have everything they could possibly want. And they are the unhappiest people on earth. because they live in a state of constant greed and fear. Yeah. This is why the this, this story of A Christmas Carol, the transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge, is such a powerful, powerful story. Anything else from anyone? Thank you, Swayam, as always. That's a great explanation, Brother Shankara. Uh, you said it so nicely. Our external world is created to make people believe everything is in our control. Nothing is in really in our control. Amen. Right? That's why kids and everybody, you know, we live under delusion continuously. The yes. world is living under delusion because yes. we, yes. I mean, we can well, find... Is, is as Sri Krishna says very early on in the Gita, your fundamental delusion is that you are the doer. How can you possibly be in control? You're not the doer. God alone is the doer. God alone is real. So there we are. We are not the ones in control of, in charge of life. No. It's, there is a higher power is in charge of the whole universe. That fact is missing in our world, in our current generation in the world and then the little ones and everybody thinks everything is in their control that's what it is wow. you thank you that what, was a, great what a what a what a what a horrible horrible delusion i know yes thank you dear thanks brother Shri. anything else from anyone tomorrow is swamiji's birthday you you were mentioning the Yes, we're going to celebrate Swamiji's birthday along with Raja Maharaja's birthday on the 22nd oh. of this month. Aditya Chaturvedi will will uh, uh, do the puja for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that is so, but this this Sunday, uh, the, the topic is letter from letter to John Doe. And it's about this business of why we uh, look away from the reality. So that's what this Sunday's talk will be about. And we'll have our Saturday class. That'll be our next activity, our Saturday class on how to know God. As far as I know, I mean, I'm feeling better each day. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears, I'm going to sign off. So, good to have been with you. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind.
may we be always and know we are always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. I hope you feel better and better. <laughs>